Let us begin the speed run, ladies and gentlemen. Let us begin the speed run. And I'm going to play three minutes and two seconds increment. We've got a 500 for the first game. So we're going to play e5. This is three plus two, three minutes and two seconds. Knight f3, knight c6. Everybody's familiar with this line. And he plays the scotch game. Now, the scotch is one of the oldest openings in existence. The idea of the scotch is to immediately contest the center and to open up the bishop. Obviously, we need to respond to the tension in the center. The downside of the scotch is that he has moved the same piece twice in the opening. Why is that bad? Well, the, part of the reason that it's dangerous to do so is I can develop my pieces and simultaneously attack his pieces while I'm doing that. That is called developing with tempo. He takes my knight. Now, XQC, uh, Charlie against XQC played queen f6, which I'm going to do here. This is Charlie's move against XQC. You actually do not take the knight. This is called an in-between move. He plays f3 to defend. I'm actually going to do five-minute games, guys. This is going to be too fast. Now, what is the downside of the move f3? What is the downside of the move f3? Thank you for the 500 bits, mid slam. And how should I take this knight? How should I take this knight? Now, f3 weakens the king, obviously. I actually will take it with the deep on because you open the diagonal for the bishop. When you're considering recaptures, one thing that you should always consider, how can I recapture while also operating in a manner that is conducive to my development? Now, here's the thing. I'm going to develop my knight here. He cannot castle. That's why Ben Feingold says never play f3. The move f3 essentially opens up the diagonal and because i've developed my bishop to c5 he's going to have a very hard time castling why is that a bad thing and he plays bishop f4 what is the problem in this move problem with this move is he doesn't see my queen he only sees the fact that he's attacking a pawn and this will make me introduce the concept of tunnel vision he blunders his piece the concept of tunnel vision is an umbrella term that i use to describe I would say a majority of mistakes that are made by players uh, in the beginner level, let's say roughly 100 to 1,000. Do I want to trade queens here? And this will make me talk about a very, very important concept, which is converting material advantages. That is going to be the theme of today, converting the theme of this game, rather, converting material advantages. Converting material advantage. Thank you, Sri Raja, for the sub. Now, I will talk after the game, and I'm writing down what I want to talk about. He goes f4. Now, whenever a pawn is moved, remember, check whether any pieces or pawns have been left unprotected. Because by definition, moving a pawn leaves weaknesses in its wake. Obviously, this leaves e4 unprotected or b2. Which pawn is better to take? Queen takes b2. Very good. Because taking the pawn on b2, when you see a good move, look for a better one, also attacks the rook on a1. He cannot move this rook. He's going to lose this rook. Because... If he plays queen c3 to try to x-ray defend the rook, notice that the queen and the king are on the same diagonal. Big advice. Whenever the queen and the king are on the same diagonal, look for pins, okay? That happens so often. He just doesn't move the rook. He doesn't move the rook at all. So I'm going to take it. Now I'm up a rook in a piece, and I'm attacking the knight. And guess what, guys? He still, not, cannot, he still cannot castle. That is what kills him. He has to move his king out to defend the knight. Now, here's the thing. It's important now to evacuate the queen. I don't want the queen to get trapped on a1, so I'm just going to move it back to, e, uh, to e5, and I'm going to pin this pawn to the king. I'm going to pin this pawn to the king. Why not bishop f2 check and take the queen? Um, I'll talk about it, and he resigns. Okay, so let's talk briefly about this game. Now, the first mistake that he played, now queen f6 should make sense to everybody. I'm developing my queen and attacking the pawn threatening scholars. Now, what would have been the correct move? The correct move would have been queen f3. The correct move would have been queen f3. And according to theory, the move queen takes f3, this is an endgame which has occurred many, many times, thousands of times in top level games. I will also do a little bit of trivia when we have an opening. I will tell you guys when the opening was first played and who first played it. So I'm going to use chess base to fill you guys in on some historical information. The scotch was first played, drum roll please, the first time that the move d4 was ever played, and you guys are going to have to give me a second, this, this really takes a very heavy toll on my computer, by Napoleon! Napoleon Bonaparte was the first person actually, according to my search, 
who played the Scotch against General Bertrand. Napoleon was a um, Napoleon was actually an avid chess player that has proven, but his actual games have been of disputed veracity. So people think that Napoleon's games may have been made up. Five bucks from Blind Spot and five bucks from Shoot Commander. Thank you so much. Uh, according to chess historian Edward Winter, he thinks that Napoleon's games may have been made up as a kind of propaganda tool to show everybody how good he is at chess. We'll talk about that later. Why is it called the Scotch? Because in 1824, the city of Edinburgh, which is the largest city in Scotland, the members of the, city, of the chess club of Edinburgh played a game with the members of the chess club of London and actually played the Scotch. So that's why it's called the Scotch, and they played it several times. Um, it was very common in the 19th century to have chess games between various cities. Um, now, after e takes d4, knight takes d4, bishop c5, knight takes c6, queen f6, the position that you see on the board in front of you, the move f3 has been played 117 times. Um, first played in 1993, but this is a big mistake. The reason this is a big mistake, as I explained, is that it opens up the diagonal. And in general, I know this is a very general piece of advice, but be very careful about pushing pawns in front of your king. Not only f3, but moves like g3 or h3 all create weaknesses around your king. That needs to be treated with the highest degree of caution. Okay? Um, and here I play d takes c6, which, why am I doubling my pawns? A lot of you might look at this and say, Daniel, what, what the hell are you doing? You're, you're ruining your pawn structure. But, thank you, the read grace for the sub. Thank you guys so much for the support. It's important to recognize that in the opening, development is more important than the pawn structure. Okay, you guys can write this down or remember it. Development is more important than small deficiencies in the pawn structure like doubled pawns. In general, I think the pawn structures are largely overrated. Bart, Bacon, and Carne, and another sub. What an incredible support, guys. So I could have taken with a queen and preserved the health of my pawn structure, but then my bishop would not be developed. And also, after knight c3, let's say that I want to develop my bishop to play d6. Great. Do you guys think this is a good move? Do you guys think this is a good move? Who can tell me why this is a good move? Because I am developing my bishop. But guess what? Following another piece of advice I shared, the queen and the king are on the same diagonal. Boom, shakalaka, this wins the queen. Always watch for the queen and the king on the same diagonal. Okay? So after dc, I developed my knight to e7. I would have liked to develop it to, e to f6, but I can't. And the final two pieces of advice I have before we transition to the next game. I know that I'm spending a while on each game, but that's the point of the speed run. Mm. A lot of people in this position will be tempted by a particular move. Could somebody tell me what move seems very tempting here? What move seems like it actually could be very, very strong? Yeah, good job, uh, Andrew FB. Queen h4 check, checking the king. Now, this seems tempting because if the king moves, this is essentially checkmate. But what can white do? Hey, fiery, white can actually block with a pawn. And so it's very, very important not to get overly tempted by checks, particularly when you don't have your pieces developed. So many times I see beginners basically looking at a check and delivering it basically because it is a check. But remember, the king moving away from a check is not the only way to defend against a check. You can also block a check with a pawn. And that is very commonly missed by beginners, actually by a lot of players. So that's why I developed the knight. He played bishop f4. And after this, things just went completely downhill for him. Now, I think we had a question at some moment about bishop f2 check. Was that here? Were people asking about bishop f2 check here, trying to distract the king from the queen? Well, the, if, the, if that's the case, remember, the knight is also defending the queen. So I can actually just take with the king. And if you take my queen, the knight also. So count all of the defenders of a particular piece, not only one of them. Okay. Akila asks... Why not queen d4 to threaten mate and the bishop? At which point, Aquila? At which point, Aquila? Here, you can just take the queen. Here, you can just take the queen. So that, that is no good. Last thing I'll share about this position. How would I have played if I were white here? Let's say you make this mistake. Are you just busted? You're not busted. There is things that white can do. Silver turtle 14. And I will use this to introduce the concept of a plan. Now, everybody has heard the word plan before. <laughs> Plan is a sequence of steps that you want to achieve to accomplish a particular goal. Q42, holy smokes. People need to stop. This is crazy, crazy amount of subs and support. Thank you, guys. Now, 
the thing with a plan is plans are hard to generate if you're a beginner because you don't have a great grasp on strategies and on pieces. So it's hard to find one move, much less generate a sequence of steps. But I do want to show you how I think about planning. And we'll obviously talk a lot more about that when I play more advanced players. Thank you, Player Jaguar, for the sub with Twitch Prime. What could a plan be in this position? What could a plan be in this position? And when I ask what a plan could be, I'm asking about the final objective. What would be the final objective of a good plan here for White? What does White want to achieve? And you guys do know what White wants to achieve. White wants to castle. So there are two possible plans. One is to castle long, and in order to castle long, what do you need to do? You need to develop the knight, the bishop, the queen, and you can castle long. That is one plan. What would be the other plan if White wanted to castle short? What would he need to accomplish as an intermediate step in order to castle short? Thank you, Stefan Jacobs, for the sub. Can, why can't White castle uh, short? He would have to get rid of the bishop. Then I ask myself, how could I get rid of the bishop? Well, I would have to put my bishop on e3. Captain, call the sub. Why can't I put my bishop on e3? Cash flow real. This is unbelievable amount of subs right now. Thank you guys so much. You can't play bishop e3 because the square is undefended. Okay, so how do I prepare bishop e3? No, I'm sure you think I can't keep up with this. You would have to play queen e2. Okay, let's say the flat castles. Can you now finally play bishop e3 out of court? Thank you for the sub. This is ridiculous. Thank you. Can you finally play bishop e3 or do you need one more preparatory move? No, you cannot because the b2 pawn is hanging. And Stefan gifting us up to code sensei and wordable subbing. This is ridiculous. Now, what would you need to do then in order to block the queen's access to b2? You would have to go either knight c3 or you would have to go c3. And then you can finally go bishop e3 and prepare to castle. So I know that when you hear the word plan, you might think of some mythical 15 move idea. But guess what, guys? Plans can actually be pretty simple. And I claim that even a beginner can come up with a plan if you know how to think logically and you know how to essentially, you know, how to ask the right kinds of questions. Meet Slim, five subs to the community. Crumbly Cheesecake, Teddy Teddy, Fell Jones, Wolfie6925, and Netsky. Thank you so much. Well, Ibrarix asks, isn't trading dark squared bishop bad for white? It could be, but it's very important to have a set of priorities. The top priority for white is the castle. I don't care. I don't care what's a good trade and a bad trade as long as I can castle because I would much rather not get checkmated, thank you, Pon M, than care about good trades and bad trades. So I'll talk more about priorities later. After he blunders the bishop, the game is basically over. So takeaways from this game. Number one, first and foremost, very, be very careful about pawn moves in front of your king, particularly the move f3 as Ben Feingold reminds us. Number two, development is more important than pawn structure, especially in the opening. Number three, in terms of planning, you ask yourself questions about what you want to accomplish, and then you try to understand the obstacles that stand in your way of accomplishing it. Obstacle number one is the bishop. Obstacle number two is the fact that the e3 square is not defended. Obstacle number three is the fact that the b2 pawn is now not under control if we play bishop b3. Solving all of the obstacles leads us to a plan. A plan leads us to accomplishing an objective. Any questions before we move on? Okay, I'm writing all of this down so I can later maybe form a document where I contain all of these advices. Now let's continue with the next game. I, wanna keep, I do wanna keep things moving smoothly, so 